Our next talk will be on the initial evaluation and treatment of common hand injuries. So obviously those are uh, highly noticeable injuries with uh, my five and seven year old at home. I see them all the time with I don't know how many times their fingers have been shut in the door or been stepped on or what have you. So I'll be paying attention here with what Dr. Indrish Vinka Teriapa has to say or Dr. V Indrish around the office. Uh, Dr. Vinka Teriapa joined Wright State Orthopedics earlier this year uh, after completing an orthopedic residency in India as well as some additional orthopedic surgery training in England. He is part of the orthopedic trauma coverage at Miami Valley Hospital. Dr. Vinka Teriapa specializes in adult reconstruction and trauma care. He is an assistant professor at Wright State University Boonshaw School of Medicine. So please welcome Dr. Indrish. Thanks, Dr. Ellis, for the nice introduction. But my talk today is uh, initial evaluation and treatment of common hand injuries. I'll try and make it as interactive as possible. You're, you're welcome to stop in between and ask questions if at any point you did not understand or may need more explanation. I have nothing to disclose. And uh, hand, according to me, is a more complex structure with a lot of um, too many structures in a small area. I think it is uh, next in complexity compared to the brain. So um, I'll spend a few minutes here going over the anatomy of the hand. And uh, while we, uh, when we consider injuries in the hand, we have certain landmarks we can uh, focus on, it will be easier to communicate with our colleagues if we are referring our, to ourselves so that we know what structures is in that, uh, in that particular area type. So um, the lines which are important here in, our, in the hand, which most commonly we refer to are the uh, thinar, uh, uh, the um, palmar creases, this is the transverse palmar crease, that's the uh, distal distal transverse palmar crease and the uh, proximal transverse palmar crease. So if there's a cut in that area, that kind of uh, gives us uh, some, you know, to a message to convey to our colleagues like it, this is where the cut is and we know the structures in, in that locality. Mostly it is the, uh, the pulleys which are located there. The A1 pulley is in line with this uh, uh, distal palmar crease, that's something important. And uh, obviously the thenar and the hypothenar eminences, these are the, the uh, prominence we can see in our hand. If you see any loss of bulk of that muscle, then we know that uh, a certain nerve is involved, which I'll go over in, uh, for in detail in my talk. And uh, going further, uh, bones uh, in our hand. So it's a trivia question, you know. Can anybody guess how many bones we have in hand? Too many. 20, 27, you know, it's just like nothing important, but uh, you know, one of my nep uh, nephew, he, when he is just four years old, he called me and asked like, uh, how many bones are in our body? I, I, I didn't know, and I said, maybe 256? He said, no, it's 206. <laughs> so, so sometimes if we get too much into detail, we can, you forget the broad area of the subject. Yeah. The uh, carpal bones, just to go over the bones here in the hand, we have like three sets of phalanges in the four fingers. There's the distal, middle, and the uh, proximal phalanx. But if you notice in the thumb, there are only two phalanges, uh, a proximal and distal phalanx. So sometimes uh, we need to keep that in mind that uh, thumb has only two, two phalanges and one interphalangeal joint, okay? And um, as far as the carpal bones are concerned, um, there are two rows, one is the, the proximal row and the, uh, uh, and the uh, distal row. Uh, the way I used to remember is like a mnemonic, 
Uh, does anybody know any mnemonic? Uh, uh, so she looks too pretty, try to catch her. That's what I remember. So uh, start from uh, S, uh, she, uh, scaphoid, look, uh, it's a lunate, and then a triquetral and uh, the uh, PC form. And again, coming back again from radial to ulnar side, it's a trapezium, trapezoid, and a capitate and hamate. Okay. So if you f focus on the X-ray and concentrate on each bone, sometimes the relationship to each other will uh, help us identify and rule out um, injuries. And, uh, next. Uh, movements in our hand is also pretty important in uh, for us to understand and again to communicate with each other. Um, as far as the, uh, apart from the regular flexion extension movements, uh, there are more movements in the fingers, which is like abduction that is spreading the fingers and uh, adduction is bringing them together. This is in, with reference to the fingers. But with the thumb, which is almost uh, in uh, right angles to the other fingers, the movements get a little confused. So uh, if, you, if the thumb is pointed out like this, it is called thumb abduction. And if it, com if it comes in line with the other fingers, it is called thumb adduction. Thumb abduction, thumb adduction. For simplicity, some people, uh, the other movements like this, these movements, they can say palmar abduction and palmar adduction but it is also called as flexion, extension. Flexion, extension. Abduction, abduction. Everybody get that? This is abduction, adduction, flexion, extension. And a deviation wise, it's a ulnar deviation toward the ulnar side and radial deviation. This is with, with the wrist and uh, even uh, pronation, supination also sometimes will be important in, uh, uh, you know, since it's, par it's more uh, proximal, but it's, it's something important to know. This is neutral. If, it go, if the palm is facing down, it's pronation, and palm facing up, supination. This is the thumb movement, which I just bent over. And uh, one, one more thing I forgot is the opposition. When they say it's opposition, try to ca counting the fingers. This is this movement with the thumb is called uh, opposition, which involves like um, one or two more group of muscles acting at the same time. And uh, going in detail about the structures in our hand further after bones is the ligaments. These are the long ligaments, which are uh, on the palmar side is the flexor tendons. There are usually two. It's a flexor digitorum profundus. Pro, profundus is the long one, so it gets attached distally. Okay, it gets attached almost at the base of the distal phalanx, almost in this location there. And uh, the flexor digitorum superficialis is uh, is a shorter tendon. S for short. That's how it's uh, something uh, easy to remember. But heat fall. It, it gets attached to the middle phalanx, it divides into two slips, and then it gets attached on either side of the middle phalanx. I'll, I'll show you that in detail in the next slide. On the uh, dorsal side, we have the extensor digitorum, or the extensor digitorum communis. These tendons um, go all the way up till the tip of the uh, distal phalanx and gets attached there. So let me show you the cross section here. The profund, uh, flexor digitorum profundus, it's gone all the way till here. And uh, flexor digitorum superficialis, it goes here. It splits into two limbs and gets attached on either side of the middle phalanx there. And uh, this is the flex, uh, extensor tendon. You have some attachments uh, where it has an expansion and certain intrinsic muscles, that is the small muscles like add, uh, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, those gets attached to this, uh, this expansion in the tendon. And further down, it, it has like, it again divides into three slips. The central slip, what uh, Dr. Johnson was mentioning in that uh, botanary deformity, 
it gets attached to the base of the middle phalanx there and the other two slips further go down, join together and gets attached to the base of the distal phalanx there. So this is in short about the uh, tendons. And any questions so far? The intrinsic muscles, uh, like there are three sets of muscles. Uh, I, it can be uh, the tenor eminence muscles, which usually help in thumb movements, like uh, the, up, the adduction and the opposition. We don't want to go in detail with those muscles for, for this talk. And the hypotenor, which is more involved on the, uh, on the little finger movements. And uh, there are the lumbricals, which gets attached into the profundus tendon. The, the function of the lumbrical is basically, this is important if you keep in mind, they basically help in flexing the metacarpophalangeal joints. And as they do that, they also uh, kind of put some stretch on that uh, uh, extensor tendon and it helps in extending the interphalangeal joints. So basically they help in extending the interphalangeal joints and flexing the uh, metacarpophalangeal joints. It's basically based on the uh, kind of attachment it has, which goes from the uh, from the volar side onto the dorsum. So, all right. So, the blood supply to the hand is by two uh, major arteries: the uh, radial and the ulnar. And for the most part, uh, radial will be um, a major su a source of supply, but. Um, one good thing is even if for some reason, if, uh, if during any laceration, if the radial artery is cut, uh, the ulnar artery itself is more some, is some sufficient to supply the hand unless they have an a anomaly where they don't have a, a, a decent size ulnar artery. So we can sometimes even uh, test whether you have both arteries or not in uh, a simple test where you occlude one exsanguinate the hand, occlude both the arteries, and then release one at a time and see uh, whether the hand is perfusing or not. So if in that case you can uh, identify whether both arteries are present or not. And when these arteries go down, it forms two arches, the superficial and the deep arch. So the uh, deep arch supplies most of the proximal hand and the, uh, the superficial arch is further divided into digital arteries, and we have one on either side of the uh, fingers. Uh, something to remember is, if you see in the ER with a laceration in the hand and it's bleeding, and you, exp and you, you identify that the digital artery is cut, that means almost most of the time, or I would say even always, the digital nerve is also cut. The reason being, nerve is more superficial to the artery in the hand, uh, in, in the finger. So uh, just to keep that point in mind and, and make necessary referrals for uh, any digital nerve repa repairs. And about the nerves, the three main nerves uh, which supply the hand are the radial, ulnar, and the median nerve. Uh, radial nerve usually uh, Sub, uh, I'll just go over the sensation part here. It's on the dorsum of the hand, so uh, it's right in that first web space. If you, f if patient has some numbness, that is more related to the radial nerve uh, distribution. And uh, in the median nerve, it is on the uh, radial three hands on the palmar side. So, uh, if you can, the best way to rule out is. Uh, if you see the tip of the index finger and if they don't have any sensation there or in the uh, tip of the thumb, that's more related to uh, involvement of the median nerve. And the, the ulnar nerve sensation is on the ulnar border of the hand, the ulnar one and a half digit. So uh, I would not test the ring finger for any one particular nerve, because since it has an overlap of nerves, it gets confusing. So it's always better to see, look for a digit which has a sole supply with a particular nerve. So uh, on the dorsum, 
on the radial one and a half it is the uh, radial nerve like as I mentioned earlier and on the ulnar side it is by the uh, ulnar nerve but the tip of the f digits on the radial one uh, three and a half is supplied by the median nerve that is the reason why I told it's better to test for the radial nerve just in the first web space so that is more um, you know autonomous for the sub uh, for the nerve sensation supply for the radial nerve and so while uh, we are looking at injuries in the hand uh, just to go, it's very important to go over the history because it gives us more information and also rule and also uh, try and focus on uh, area of what we want to examine like uh, sometimes time and cause of injury gives us a clue uh, like uh, cause of injury like if somebody says if it, it was a, 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 a laceration a knife uh, assault or something we expect that it could or the defense injury versus offending injury you know that if it's cut on the ulnar side uh, it's most likely you expect the tendons to be cut and a position of the hand, especially in case of uh, human bites, if it was a, a fight bite where they hit, the, it, the hand is flexed and you have an injury and when they, and that, that it's important to know the position because when they extend their hand, that a tendon which is cut would have migrated proximally and you may miss that easily. And um, occupation wise, certain occupations are more at risk for injuries, especially like um, like high pressure injection injuries in, um, when they are using the painting sprays, those are really dangerous. If you, if you happen to see a patient in your office or ER with a high pressure injection injury, that is, it's almost an emergency that needs exploration um, as soon as possible. Because since hand has really a closed space and with this high pressure injection, it causes significant trauma to the internal structures and can uh, lead to more complications which might uh, be more detrimental. And previous hand injuries sometimes help as well because if they had some previous nerve cut and if they are not, if they are having numbness, you can relate that it, it was something which was pre-existing so that you can document and we know that it's not related to the current injury. And external wounds also kind of gives um, Imp uh, more information on what uh, tendons are cut and whether the nerve is cut. Like, as I said, if there's active bleeding, it's more likely that there is an injury to the nerve as well. And uh, checking for sensation, like as Dr. Uh, Johnson mentioned, it's always better to check for sensation before anesthetizing if they have open wounds so that, you know, you have not uh, numbed the nerve. And the best way to check for sensation is a two-point discrimination that's more uh, specific, so we can use on a, a paper, cli paper clip in our office, keep it at a distance of six millimeters apart, and check for two-point discrimination at the tip of the digit. That uh, gives us a specific uh, uh, way of uh, examining. And uh, for the uh, motor function, I went over the sensation, but for the motor function in the hand, for the three nerves, uh, radial nerve is basically it's an extender, so you, you can extend the fingers and the thumb extender. If you remember, okay. And um, for the ulnar nerve, it is basically finger abduction or adduction, abduction or adduction. Sometimes it's hard to check for the strength, but the uh, more precise test, which I think it's it's easy for us to, uh, you know see visibly is what's called the flow of froment sign if anybody is aware of that it's basically it uh, checks for the uh, thumb adduction which is supplied by the ulnar nerve it's the only nerve uh, muscle of the thumb which is supplied by the ulnar nerve so the, the function of that is if you in your office if you ask the patient to ho grab the paper both like this and if you try to pull the paper on the side where they have the ulnar nerve involvement, they go like this. You can see pretty obvious. They try to hold the paper with by flexing the interphalangeal joint like this because the adductors are not working, so they hold like this. So that is classic for ulnar nerve injury. 
And for the median nerve, again, a thumb flexion or uh, opposition, if they're not able to do this, this is, uh, what is for the median now. Okay. Any doubts? Any questions so far? And I'll go over this again uh, about, the, uh, about testing for the function of the flexor tendons. Okay. So FDP. So since we know that the anatomy of it, it attaches to the tip, uh, almost the base of the distal phalanx, so it, we need to test the uh, distal interphalangeal joint. So we immobilize the proximal interphalangeal joint and try to do this. So this is for the FDP tendon. And for the FDS tendon, uh, because for any finger, like since if you try to flex, since both tendons will, will be acting together, we want to isolate only to the FDS tendon. So in, in order to do that, whichever finger we are examining, we can keep that finger flex and the remaining keep kept extended. So in that way, you are kind of lengthening the uh, FDP tendon and avoid that to work so that uh, this will be isolating to the action of FDS. So this is the way of checking for FDS. So, so like in this, this finger now, my FDP is not working because it's pulled out to length by stretching the other fingers because all the FDP tendons have a common muscle belly. So if they, they all act together and so in that way, while stretching this, you kind of avoided the uh, action or uh, ruled out the uh, muscle action of the FDP, so only FDS is tested. Is that clear? Okay. And this is a brief overview of the anatomy, and if you, if at any point, if you need any more, we'll go over on the anatomy points. But going over a few of the common injuries we come across in our hand, I'll, I'll try to cover most of this uh, in today's talk. And uh, fingertip injuries. So uh, this is pretty commonly seen because that's the most uh, sensitive part of our body and we try to pick things and it's common to have injuries which can be smaller or larger, but we have to make decision which one needs referral and um, which can be treated uh, without uh, any surgical intervention. Uh, so um, the um, rule of thumb is if you have uh, lesser than one centimeter of uh, open wound at the fingertip, and if no bone is exposed, it is, it, this can be treated without surgery by just doing uh, local dressing changes and let the wound granulate and heal secondarily. But if it is more than a centimeter, then it probably needs a referral to a plastic surgeon or a hand surgeon where they can uh, try and uh, cover that, that open area and make it heal faster and also give a more sensitive fingertip. And if, if bone is exposed, that again needs more attention uh, with a further surgical intervention, which may be even to um, uh, either freshen off the bone tip and then try to close it or try to get a good cover or on top of the uh, exposed bone. So just to go over the three zones here, like uh, zone one is just distal to that uh, tip of the uh, distal phalanx and zone two is in our, in our nail, if you can see, I think thumb is the best nail to see. You can see that uh, semilunar uh, white area, that is the lunula. So whatever area is distal to that is, uh, belongs to zone two, and uh, proximal to that uh, till the base of the distal phalanx is the uh, zone three of the fingertip. So this kind of gives us a referral, um, a rough idea where, where the um, fingertip injury belongs to. For in zone one, for the most part, like uh, it can be treated without surgery, but if it's zone two or three, may need uh, further uh, intervention. So here, uh, you guys take a guess. How would we treat this one here? Sorry. 
probably we may have to see the other surf other side as well on the uh, wall or side if it is less than one centimeter square probably we can treat uh, by just dressing changes this one too it is just the tip so probably just the dressing changes whereas here you can see it's gone through almost zone two and uh, trying to enter zone three and there is definitely nail bed injury and uh, most part of the sensitive part of the fingertip is gone, so this may need a further plastic cover or flap cover of some sort. And same here as well. Those two needs to be referred out. And a subungual hematoma, doctor. I know uh, there is a bit of an overlap here, but just to reinstate again, um, if we have, it's pretty common because if you get your finger or fingertips jammed again in a, with, in a door or a car or with a hammer or anything can cause this. And if the hematoma is less than 50%, it, that means it can be treated just by draining and we don't have to address the nail bed injury or, the, or does not require removal of the nail. And Draining this hematoma gives a significant relief of pain to the patient because it's, it's, in, it's in such a close compartment and nail will not expand. So patients will become really comfortable if we try to drain this hematoma. So a um, so couple of ways of doing it. You can either use a, a electrocautery if you have in the office or maybe just heat up a paper clip and uh, can be penetrated or a large bore needle can work as well. So basically the nail plate has to be perforated and get into the hematoma and then let it drain. So, and this is the cautery if you have in the office that's sometimes uh, helpful too. Okay. So uh, going down to the nail bed lacerations if you, like in the previous slide I mentioned, if it is more than 50% of uh, hematoma involving the uh, nail, then probably we have to take out the nail, examine the uh, uh, nail bed, and if there is any laceration, probably need to be repaired. Uh, most, most of the times we use uh, dissolvable sutures, and uh, sometimes we can even approximate the, uh, if it's just a straight cut or laceration in the nail bed, approximate and uh, put some derma bond uh, to, uh, to get the edges together. Those have shown uh, almost equivalent results compared to sewing, so that might uh, save some time and also results are in fact better or if not the same compared to suturing. And if again it goes without saying, if there is an open wound, we have to clean and uh, debris thoroughly and then um, uh, perform the repair and uh, probably put on, uh, uh, check their tetanus status and um, antibiotics for prophylaxis. And this is how the uh, nail bed injuries looks. Here you, you cannot do any kind of a repair because it's almost damaged and it, it, it's, you cannot see the nail bed here. But if you just see a small crack uh, or which extends all the way through, it's probably worth uh, uh, repairing that by uh, sewing or using dermabond. Another common injury we come across is mallet finger. So uh, again, it, you can see in sports and also uh, uh, hit against a hard object. Basically, it is because of the forced flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. So it can be either just the rupture of that uh, extensor tendon, which gets attached to that uh, base of the distal phalanx, or it can either uh, uh, take AWOL's uh, chip of bone from the uh, base. So in either case, uh, the initial treatment is to treat non-surgically. So the main thing which makes a big difference is to keep the, the involved digit in extension as early as possible and to maintain in extension, for, in extension for at least six weeks. That is the standard recommendation. After six weeks, you can, uh, it's also recommended to use further, uh, on, but only at night times. So up to eight weeks, uh, 
uh, we need to keep that uh, finger in extension. I'll just show you in the next slide. So there are different uh, designs of these splints available in the market. Any of these things will work. Uh, and so uh, as long as you get the uh, distal interphalangeal joint in extension and keep it all the time, 24 hours, they cannot take this out for uh, you know, uh, personal hygiene and all. That has to remain there 24 hours because any time you take out, there will be that slack and it may delay healing. And even after treating with uh, so much of precaution, still they may end up having a small lag in extension. They may not be able to uh, get it out fully straight. But a surgery also has its own complications and may not give great results. So we, tend, we prefer to treat this non-surgically. This is something simple. If you are not able to find a splint in your office, uh, just uh, till, they, till, till you transition to a definitive splint, this is something you can use like a paper clip or any stiff object placed against the dorsum and uh, wrap it to keep the finger in extension. Uh, to go over, um, in detail, just a brief about the flexor tendon injuries. Uh, we should keep in mind that flexor tendon, tendon injuries need to be repaired. And uh, a few things in particular about this tendon is it has a flex, it's a, it has a tendon sheath. So uh, since it has a tendon sheath, they, it, it communicates almost proximally. So there is a higher chance of this getting infected. That's what we call as flexor tenosynovitis. So if there's an open wound and tendon involvement, it's probably better to take wash out, debride, and also repair the tendon. And um, Function-wise, it has a significant implications if we don't repair, so probably uh, it's, it's worth, uh, if, say for example, if we have a wound on the volar aspect of the hand and the exposed tendon, things to rule out is whether the tendon is injured or not, if so, how much portion of the tendon is cut, if it is visible. If it is less than 50%, they, and they have a functioning tendon with, with like the test what we did and if, if they're able to uh, function then it can be treated without surgery. If it is over 50 percent then it is uh, shown that it's probably weaker and needs repair and need to be referred. And uh, it, it's not always that uh, now these days hand surgeons will take this patient on an emergent basis the same day. So as long as we wash, clean the wound, and close it, and uh, splint it, and send it to the office, they can go back and explore and uh, do it in the, in, a, in the next day or two. That is the, uh, the usual uh, uh, practice which is uh, followed uh, for the most part. So uh, let's see. So this is how you, you can either see a cut or without a cut, which I, I'll, see, I'll tell you what exactly. I'm not by the If there is a cut, then obviously we have to uh, check for sensation, anesthetize the uh, thumb, uh, and then see for the, uh, explore the tendon and see how uh, extensive is the uh, tendon injury. If there is no cut, and if you see that there is um, a defect in the function of flexion that is most, mostly we call it as a jersey finger. That is in, when the fingertip gets caught against a sub, uh, and if it, it's the forceful extension of the interphalangeal joint. This causes a rupture of the FDP tendon, which uh, uh, can either um, get a detached through, through a piece of bone or just the base of the, uh, the distal portion of the tendon might get uh, detached. So these things need to be treated surgically. And since it, depending upon how much force the uh, finger, the uh, injury has caused, that tendon can migrate all the way down. So we have to refer, refer these kind of patients as soon as possible so that they can get to and uh, repair it. Uh, one important point to keep in mind is 
Suppose if this tendon has lost any, len any length of it, and if a surgeon tries to uh, pull it beyond the length where it belongs, so it's basically shortened the tendon and uh, attached to a point which is beyond that. So what that basically causes is it, uh, since it's a, it has a common muscle belly, patients will lose the uh, finger grip. Uh, they, they'll not be able to make a fist. Even if they make a fist, it'll be a weaker grip. So that is definitely something we should keep in mind. We call this as quadriga effect. So what I mean to say is, say for example, if a length of this tendon is five centimeters, and now you have only four centimeter tendon remaining, and but you take that four centimeter tendon and attach it to a point where it originally got attached, so you have pulled that length, you, you have stretched that. So that kind of lax, causes laxity on the tendons, which has a common belly in the other finger. So when you try to make a fist, they have like, they have weaker grip strength. So that's why that's, uh, that thing is important to keep in mind. So for us, uh, we have to make sure that we don't excise any tendons or that just leave it be and the hand surgeon can decide whether he can use a allograft or try and uh, attach it at, um, at a more proximal level or something which he can work with. And again, a ring finger is one which is more commonly involved as far as the, the jersey finger goes. And um, this is a picture representation of what I was mentioning earlier. Here. You can see that it can be just the, through the bone or maybe just the tendon in this region. How it looks. You see this kind of a sign, that's how physical examination is important. You pretty much are certain that there is a involvement of a tendon injury in this ring finger because it is kept extended. Because of the unopposed action of the extensor tendon, this finger sticks out in relation to the other digits. And um, extensor tendon, these the zones which you have to uh, of some anatomic uh, uh, relevance, like where exactly the tendon is cut. If it is zone one, uh, like as we discussed earlier, it is the mallet finger, but if it's a zone two, three, or four, it is uh, more on the dorsal side, and the tendon won't retract too much. It, it, you can, it is quite possible to see the edges together, and it can be sewed. And uh, if it goes beyond zone six, that's when the, uh, the uh, proximal end of the tendon migrates and it may not be able to, uh, you may have to extend the incision to find the uh, tip, proximal tip of the tendon to reattach. And uh, one more thing to keep in mind is the, the fight bites which, which falls in the zone five. This need to be, it's always better to explore and uh, I would almost always refer it to uh, take the patient to the operating room and examine formally uh, by extending the, uh, the open area and make sure that there is no uh, defect in the capsule and then do a thorough irrigation. Again, uh, most commonly injured uh, digit in the hand is the uh, long digit. And uh, zone six is the most common injury. And this is just going over what I exactly mentioned. In the uh, zone five, especially in elderly individual, you can see when they try to, even a small uh, a trivial injury, just like flicking a fly, can cause uh, damage to the uh, tendons. That means we have these radial bands, what we are the sagittal bands, which keeps the tendon center over the finger. But if the bands which goes on either side of the finger, if they get ruptured, then the tendon can fall into the valley right, rather than being on the, uh, on the prominent portion of the bone. So uh, that's something which we need to uh, identify and uh, sometimes it can be treated surgically or for the most part, it, uh, they may end up requiring repair of this uh, the uh, sagittal band which helps in keeping the finger in the 
uh, the, the tendon on center of the digit rather than falling into the valley. And um, I wanted to just go over the uh, Bunyan or the uh, Botanary Deformity, which Dr. Johnson mentioned, how to test in our office. Remember the central slip, what Dr. Johnson was mentioning, which gets attached to the base of the middle phalanx here. When that gets ruptured, then they'll develop a Botanary Deformity. This is what is the Botanary Deformity, right? So in, if it is some, it, if this has occurred acutely, and if you want to rule out, a simple test to perform is place the hand on the edge of the table, and you're flexing the uh, proximal interphalangeal joint, and ask them to extend. Their extension at the CIP joint will be weaker, but this, uh, the DIP joint will be extended. So if you try to bend this, it will be stiff, and it, you'll have difficulty in bending the DIP joint, that is, if the central slip has ruptured. Once again, I go, now this is the edge of the bed, you bend like this, and if, you, if I try to push like this, that flexion, will, the extension will be weak, but this extension will be stronger because the, remember the two lateral bands which are slipped volar words will be pushing, pulling this further, so uh, this keeps the finger extended like this, so you will not be able to bend like this. If the central slip is intact, then it, it is pretty easier like this. So say for example, in my hand, I have no central slip injury, so you're pushing like this, and try this fingertip is flexible. But if there is a, flex, uh, a central slip injury, this won't be flexible. You'll not be able to bend this. Is that clear? It's called... Uh, Elson's test. This is the sagittal band rupture just I was mentioning about uh, the uh, tendon falling into the valley instead of being in the center. And any doubt of any extensor tendon injuries and whether repaired or not repaired, um, to keep them uh, the edges approximated so that they won't retract back uh, further, it's always better to keep it in extension. So this is a kind of a splint. With either you can use a prefabricated splint or one um, which is, you can make it with a fiberglass or a, a plaster of Paris and all the fingers and the uh, wrist joint need to be extended and then refer out for, for a definitive treatment. Any questions so far? Going down to a fracture and dislocation of hand, uh, like the small joints like the uh, DIP, PIP, and the MP joints dislocations, like uh, it's pretty commonly seen and also easily missed, especially in uh, multiple trauma patients. But if that is the isolated injury, they can point to it and um, Examination-wise, you can see uh, obvious deformity. Either it, uh, you can see a prominence, or it could have been uh, deviated one way or the other. So, so in this uh, DIP joint dislocation, you can see that. Can anybody tell it's a volar dislocation or a dorsal dislocation? So that. As far as dislocation goes, we always refer the uh, distal fragment in reference to the proximal fragment. So the direction where the, the distal uh, extremity or the, uh, the uh, integument is uh, shifted, that is the direction of dislocation. Here you can see that the distal phalanx is dorsal, so it is a dorsal dislocation. Okay. So, in hand, when we are reducing fractures of either the metacarpals or the phalanges, uh, direct traction does not work so well. So it's always, it's more of a maneuvering technique. So uh, if, assume this is a dorsal dislocation, I would gently uh, hold this finger and try to milk that uh, distal phalanx on top of the uh, middle phalanx, and it, it's pretty easy to 
you know, reduce this dislocation because uh, very, very rarely or almost never you get a soft tissue interposition between these two joints. And when the joint dislocation is reduced, for the most part, the uh, DIP joint dislocations are stable. After reducing, if you find it stable, you can probably buddy tape it to the uh, neighboring digit and have them start moving right away, as long as they are stable, they stay stable. But if you find it is unstable, that's when you may have to splint it. The way I would splint is put the splint on the surface, on the side where it is dislocated. So you say for example, this is a dorsal dislocation, so I would put a dorsal splint, like one of those um, malleable splints. You can put on the dorsum and then um, either buddy tape it or just uh, that single digit, you can uh, wrap it with a coband and leave it in extension for about three to four weeks and later on check for um, stability. And always take x-rays and make sure that you have reduced because it's, uh, it can be deceiving sometimes we, by the look of it because there'll be so much of a swelling, we think that it's reduced but if it is not, then uh, it'll be difficult to reduce uh, later after a few days. And coming down to the uh, proximal interphalangeal joint dislocation, this again, uh, mo most common here is the, the volar side. It tries to go on to the, uh, you can see the, dis the uh, middle phalanx, it's dislocated onto the uh, palmar aspect, okay? So here, try and exaggerate the deformity at the same time with gentle traction, try and get milk it over on top of the uh, head of the, the uh, metatar uh, metacarpal there. So this is something which can be done with gentle manuring. This is a, a pictorial representation of how you can do it. So it's, uh, but like as I said, not much traction, it's more of a gentle manuring to get to sit over the uh, head of the metacar metacarpal there. And these joints can be pretty unstable, so they need to be immobilized for a while. So here, again, if it is a dorsal dislocation, I'll put the splint on the dorsal side and it's volar on the volar side. And uh, maintain the um, joint in about uh, maybe 30 degree of flexion sometimes, or if it is, uh, the uh, position of the digit, for, for me, like it's more depending upon in what position they are more stable. I would immobilize them in, in that position. It could be a full extension or sometimes a 30 degrees of flexion too. So this is a simple splint which you can use to immobilize. Again, uh, the duration can be up to four weeks and then uh, bring them back in the office uh, check x-rays and uh, if it is stable enough then they can start a therapy to, with range of motion. And, and metacarpophalangeal joint dislocations. These are mo most of the times they are volar because of the hyperextension. They fall on their hand and it goes through like this and uh, they can be simple or complex. If it is simple it is something real easy to reduce. If it is complex that means there is some soft tissue interposition between the uh, two ends of the bone and it's almost never possible to get it uh, reduced closed. Uh, the reason being you know, the, uh, the volar plate. What I mean by volar plate, it's the thickened uh, on the palmar aspect of the uh, joint capsule. When there is a dislocation, when the bone button holes through that plate, then it acts like a trap door. So it prevents the uh, the meta metacarpal head to go back and reduce. So it's that uh, plate, the volar plate inter intervenes between the joint surface and it's almost difficult to reduce. So this, for the most part, have to go to the operating room where we have to open up and release the uh, volar plate and then reduce the joint. So sometimes it is not uncommon to convert these simple dislocations into complex by just pulling on the finger. Just if you try to give more traction, then you can, uh, it, it is possible to uh, make it, convert it into a complex dislocation, okay? So, and if it's easily reducible, then splinting in about 30 degrees of uh, flexion and put a splint on the dorsal side, 
that, that, or some you can even put it on the volar side. Some people use on like sandwich it put both on the volar and the dorsal side if you are uh, not too comfortable uh, to maintain stability. This is, a, this is the example where you can see it's uh, dislocated dorsally. You can see that uh, the metatarsal, met, sorry, metacarpal head is uh, directed to plantar side. This is the reduction technique. So just milking over the, uh, on the dorsal side and trying to get over the head of the metacarpal without much pressure. And you can immobilize by either a splint or a cast. Okay. As far as the fractures goes, um, in, the, in the phalangeal fractures, it can be simple uh, without any rotational deformity or if you may have some rotational deformities. The, the only important thing we have to rule out is there is the fingers are not crossing over and having a rotational deformity. That is when, uh, can, that's, that can sometimes lead to significant problems. I can show you a picture here. You see this diagram there. Since there is a rotational deformity, you can see that finger is crossing over on top of each other. So in order to avoid this, have the uh, patient flex the fingers, all the fingers should be pointing right at one point, almost towards the uh, radial side. If you find any crossing over, that means it is uh, rotationally not reduced, that need to be addressed, okay? That can be addressed either by correcting and if it is staying stable to treat non-surgically, and if it is not stable, then requires a surgical stabilization. And mobilizing will be body taping for the phalanges, and uh, you can start them, start mobilizing if you find it stable at the MP joint, or you can hold it for about three, four weeks and then start gently later on. So this is how you can buddy tape to the neighboring digit and see, you can still restore motion. And if you see, these are the kind of fractures which is hard to treat uh, without uh, uh, surgery. With surgeries, it looks a lot much better without any uh, rotational or uh, shortening deformity. Like as I said, buddy taping and uh, splinting. Metacarpal fractures can be on the head, neck, or shaft. Uh, most common are at the neck, especially the, what we call it the boxer's fracture. When they hit against a the wall, they, can, uh, they end up having a fracture at the neck, head-neck junction, and uh, that sometimes need to be uh, corrected or you can accept the deformity. I'll go over the numbers in the next coming slide here. But if it is the shaft, uh, the, if it's more than two metacarpal fractures uh, in the same hand, most of the times they need to be addressed surgically. Otherwise, uh, with one, with less deformity, it can be treated without surgery. And again, no rotational deformity is accepted and not more than five millimeters of shortening. If there is shortening, then it'll, the uh, person will lose the tendon excursion and he'll, he'll have weakness. These are a few examples of the fractures you can see. And this is the fifth, believe it or not, this can be treated without surgery. If, uh, if you treat it as in the same position what it is, they just heal fine they may not have a, a cosmetically well-appearing hand. They may not have a knuckle, but function-wise, they will do fine. So these are the, uh, some numbers to uh, keep in mind while treating uh, individual digits. With the index and long finger, uh, you can accept angulation up to 10 to 15 degrees at the head neck, uh, at the neck of the fracture and ring finger up to 30, 40, and see the little finger, it can, you can accept up to 60 degrees of angulation. Still, they'll do fine without any correction. And this is, so if most of the times it is the uh, ulnar two digits which are involved, and the ulnar gutter splint is something commonly used, and this is the way you put, make sure that the wrist is extended in about 30 degrees, 
MP joints flex to about uh, 90 and other joints extended uh, like the interphalangeal joints. And uh, sprains in our hand, this is pretty commonly seen where like, you know, while involving in a fight or assault where your hand, somebody is trying to grab your hand, so, and you, they come to you and you want to, obviously we take x-rays and if there is no fracture, then most often the injury is because of the sprain of the collateral ligaments. The way to test is, if we test like this, then the capsule will be tight, we, not, we may not be able to test or, or diagnose a sprain, but if you bend the finger to 90 degree and put stress, various valgus stress like this, then they may be sore on one or the other side. So this, again, it's a treatment is simple. You can buddy tape it and uh, they'll just do fine in about three, four weeks. The one uh, in thumb, it is something which is uh, more significant of a sprain when it involves on the ulnar side, the ulnar collateral ligament, especially in skiers, it's pretty common. And uh, this, again, if you don't have significant instability, you can try treating non-surgically but if there is a significant instability, and especially if there is a, a, a ligament, sometimes it flips over uh, the upper neurosis of the, of the thumb, and it prevents the, uh, ligament, from the uh, ligament from healing, that's when you may have to do surgery to uh, take out the interposing uh, upper neurosis and uh, do a repair. But uh, it's always, you can, you can justify yourself trying conservative treatment and see if, there is any, if the symptoms get better with the thumb. And the type of splint what you use is uh, a thumb spike or splint, which I showed. This is the kind of a splint which we use, and it, it can be left in place for about uh, six weeks or so, and then the human bites, like as I mentioned earlier, it's very, uh, you have to take this very seriously. Uh, definitely almost always needs uh, irrigation debridement and formal surgical treatment. And, uh, and this is something which I was, when I was uh, trying to prepare my slides, I came across a, a handlebar palsy. That, Basically, when you put more pressure on that ulna, digital nerve of the ulna, it can cause some tingling and numbness in the ulnar nerve distribution. This is why history is important. So if they know what, what occupation and wh how the injury happened, we can narrow down our diagnosis and, uh, and um, treat appropriately. So basically, wait and watch and uh, nothing surgical, just reassurance is something what will be needed. So, um, these are some sources, uh, res resources which you can uh, find more uh, information if you need. Thank you very much. Any questions? Which one? Mel uh, six, uh, six weeks, 24 hours a day, and after six weeks, two weeks at night time. That's the standard of recommendation. So flexor tendon injuries, zone two, it depends like uh, the repair is now people are talking about repairing in two stages where they end up, they try to put some rods so that they create a tunnel. The reason why uh, zone two injuries are, uh, uh, flexor ten tendon injuries in zone two are difficult to treat are because of the lot of tunnels and the scarring and even if the tendon heals, they may not have gliding motion. So in order to get a, a nice a smooth tunnel for the tendon to glide, uh, they go ahead and put some um, uh, spacer rods, and uh, once you get a nice tunnel, then go back and do a repair if you have the existing tendon or use some kind of allograft and repair. So it, it, I would say two-stage repair if it is in the uh, zone two area. Thank you.